Okay. All right. So as you all may know, I'm kind of into the whole dead body scene and whatnot. And as you all know, I'm trying to be a mortician, going to school for it. But to me, it's not all about dead bodies. Um, I actually am motivated by, um, I have a lot of, or I've had a lot of people in my life die in the past year. Um, during the middle of the semester, I had my sponsor pass away on me, and it was probably one of the hardest things I had to go through, but I went through it, and at her viewing, I really wanted to be the one that actually did that, you know, went through the whole embalming process and whatnot. I wanted to be that person, but I couldn't obviously because I'm not through school yet. So um, today I'm going to reveal to you the effects that embalming has not only on the environment, but on the population as well. I'm also going to reveal some of the, um, the effects cremation has on the environment. And um, I'm also going to give you some alternatives that are a safer way to get dispose of a body. <laughs> I found this information in a report called Drinking Grandma. I know it sounds kind of disgusting, but it was actually a pretty cool report that I found. And it's the problem of embalming by Jeremiah. I really can't pronounce his last name, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> and his brother, Dr. Ted Chappelle. That's what I'll call him. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> embalming really didn't become popular until after the Civil War. It began to spread and become increasingly common <laughs> due to the last train ride of Abraham Lincoln's embalmed body from Washington, D.C. to Illinois, which raised more awareness to the public. In that era, bodies were arsenic-based in bombs, and until the 1900s, when it was banned due to harmful effects on the environment and the population. It was also very hard for one to detect arsenic poisoning in a murder case, so that's why they also banned it. <laughs> Modern embalming entails replacing the blood with embalming fluid. The primary ingredient in most embalming fluid is formaldehyde. It takes roughly 3.5 gallons to embalm a human body. The National, na sorry, the National Funeral Directors Association estimates that 2 million Americans are embalmed each year. That translates into roughly 7 million gallons of formaldehyde being put into the Earth's soil. These dangerous chemicals end up in the ground and also, during, are also being burned in a crematorium. The one that suffers the most, I believe, is the actual embalmer themselves. Isurso's K wrote a book called Death to Dust, What Happens to Dead Bodies, and he states that a number of studies have found that embalmers are significantly greater risk than the general public of getting cancers of the skin, brain, colon, sinuses, nose, throat, and blood, kidney failure, heart disease, and chromosomal damages. That's just to name a few. Next, I'm going to talk about the effects of cremation. I found this information on a website called environmentalcasket.com. A typical human body plus the cremation casket will weigh somewhere between 200 and 300 pounds. After cremation, just one to two pounds is left over. So where did all that other material go? Basically, literally, it means up in smoke. <laughs> Nicholas Albury, National Death Center Director and editor of National Death Handbook, writes, anyone with green, I hate this word, pretensions, there you go, should think twice about cremation, which pollutes the atmospheres with dioxin, hydraulic acid, hydrofluoric acid, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide. Some pollutants found to come from smokestacks of crematoriums include heavy metals, hydrogen chloride, dioxins, and furans. A portion of the air pollution created during cremation comes from foam rubber mattresses, polyester fabric, urethane finish, and composite wood of conventional caskets. Formaldehyde also enters the atmosphere through cremation. Cremating embalmed remains would release a large quantity of formaldehyde into the air. Once in the air, formaldehyde can last up to 250 hours. Also, mercury can be released into the atmosphere because more people are dying with their own teeth. And if you think about it, when you get a filling from the dentist, it's pretty much mercury unless you're getting porcelain, you know. And you're also breathing that in. So it kind of like makes me um, think about that saying, we are all connected as one. Because basically <laughs> when you walk outside, you could be breathing in a dead body. Or from <laughs> So now that I've revealed 
reveal to you some of the effects of embalming and cremation has on the environment and the public. I want, to, I want you to see that there are some alternatives that are a safer way. One can sign up for what is called alkaline hydrolysis, and your corpse can be liquefied and then, then burned. <laughs> the body is placed in a pressurized chamber, which is then filled with water and potassium hydroxide. After heating at 180 degrees Celsius for three hours, all that remains is softened, softened bone, ready to be crushed up and sterile. It's put into a light brown soup of amino acids and pesticides. This liquid contains no DNA and can actually be safely disposed down a drain or used as fertilizer. This is a Swedish company called Promesa Organic, led by Susan, some Swedish name that I'm not even gonna pronounce because I can't do it. And she states, this really gives people a chance to become soil again. It means that death is not the end and the beginning of a new life in the soil. Taking a similar approach to this, to the one I just gave you is called Cryomation, based uh, in Woodbridge, UK, where they would plan, where they have plans to freeze corpses to 190 to 6 degrees Celsius in liquid nitrogen before drying them into a vacuum. Researchers at the University of Hertfordshire in Hatfield and several commercial partners built a prototype of this cryomation and has plans to begin testing it on humans later this year. There does seem to be a genuine interest in the third choice to burial and cremation, says cryomation's Richard McLean. We are not trying to replace anything, but to offer an alternative that is better for the environment. He also points out that com composting and freeze-dried remains create no atmospheric emissions. In the last article that I looked up, it's called Making a Splash. Now, I think this is the coolest thing on earth. <laughs> um, the, the article was written by Helen Hunt, and she states that the U.S. company Eternal Reefs, based out in Georgia, Georgia, offers a safe alternative. It offers to encapsulate your cremated remains into a concrete ball. This can be decorated and cu customized by your family before being lowered into the coral reef, either off the coast of Florida South Carolina or Chesapeake Bay. The balls are 1.8 meters in diameter and help support the existing reef structure and encourage growth in more coral and microorganisms, creating habitat for fish and bivalves such as mussels and oysters. Now, I don't know if you guys like seafood, but I really love <laughs> seafood and mussels and oysters are probably like my favorite thing on earth. So I think that's really cool. <laughs> All right, in conclusion. <laughs> I have revealed to you today the effects of embalming and cremation has on the environment as well as the public. And I have hopefully convinced you that there are other alternatives one can take um, in disposing of a body. Burial and cremation are so 20th century. Now you can be liquefied, freeze dried, or baited to a reef when you die. The choice is really up to you. I did my hula, huh? God, I hate that. I tried so hard That's not to. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 So, Giovanni, what did you think? She states her credibility clearly, and uh, she also has personal experience in there. So, she relates to the topic as well. She has good facts. Uh, she cites her statements clearly. Good structure of the topic. A lot of citations. Uh, she recaps every each point clearly at the end. Uh, good statements from professionals and researchers. Clear conclusion, wrapping up everything at the end. Uh, great vocal projection. Uh, she seemed confident, seemed relaxed, chuckled a lot and smiled. She had a good eye contact with both sides of the class, so that was pretty good. Yay. When she makes eye contact, <laughs> which you do not do very much because you are reading an awful lot here at the end of the term, uh, and it really feels, it really feels like it's, uh, you know, you 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 need to be doing better at this point. But, you know, I we, you did look around when you looked up. Um, the main thing that I see being problematic here is this really feels much more like it's an informative speech than a persuasive speech because uh, you, 
you barely seem to be advocating these alternatives. You, you're you outlining what they are, you talk about what might be positive about them, but you don't really seem to take a definitive position. I think you know, part of that it may be problematic because it seems to be in conflict with your professional goals, mm -hmm. um, but I think if you want to make this a persuasive speech, you ought to be saying, you folks out there need to consider doing something different. In fact, getting buried or being cremated is a bad idea, and I want to convince you to try, try. <laughs> I guess trying is not the right thing, because, you know, yeah, I didn't like that. Let me try something else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I want you to choose a different alternative. And I, and I think that's the way you need to go with it. Uh, as it is, it, it seems more like it's, a, like I said, an informative speech about what alternatives are available. Let me tell you what some of the problems are with these other things and what the alternatives are. Instead of being an advocate for them, you are just informing us about them. And I think you need to be a little bit more forceful about that. Uh, I'd agree with Giovanni. There's a lot of good information in the speech. You've got uh, some research. You undermine your credibility a little bit when you have to apologize so frequently for the difficulty in pronouncing the names. I understand. You know what? 90% of the time, you come up with a pronunciation while you're practicing, that'll be fine. You don't have to worry about getting it perfect. Nobody's going to know that you don't have it perfect. If I looked at your bibliography and said, that's not even close to being the name, then I would be a little bit troubled. But the fact that you pronounced it differently is not going to be a big deal. And I don't know what the name is. You said you had like one Swedish name that you weren't yeah, even going no to attempt. It. <laughs> you know. But the truth is that uh, it's just a little bit of effort to fix those kinds of things. So maybe you don't know exactly how it's pronounced. It says uh, Cherwinski, and you just say uh, Cherwinska. Yeah, okay, so you got that. It's not a big deal, but you've practiced it. You know that's how you're going to say it. Instead, you draw attention to yourself by saying, I have no idea how to say this, and it makes a bigger deal out of it than it ought to be. All right, there we go. We'll, we'll call that a day on those. We need to move on because we have some other make goods that we want to take care of.